let me then move on, sir, and ask you about what the current situation is as far as our imports from Russia is concerned. In July, we actually saw a decline by about 5.7% uh, in terms of imports from Russia. Uh, the expectation is that we are expected to see that continue through the month of August. Uh, can you explain to us uh, whether there is a deliberate pullback uh, and what is the trajectory likely to be? Uh, thank you, Shirinji. I can always trust you to ask questions which uh, help uh, improve my understanding. First of all, there's no question of any deliberate decision by us to import more or less from a particular source. The government has nothing to do with this. The importation is being done by the private sector and the public sector companies, and they do it in a very transparent way. What they do is they float a tender and ask for prices for delivery at our port. And whoever has the lowest price, they import from that. Insofar as Russia is concerned, you're absolutely right. The month you named, there was a decline of 5.7% in this thing. But you know, this is a dynamic situation. I mean, when the uh, military uh, action took place from Russia to Ukraine, I'm talking about February of 2022, at that point of time, we were importing hardly any oil from uh, Russia. I think it was 0.2%. In the first two months after that, there was a sudden increase in imports from Russia. Why? It's a price sensitivity issue. You have a situation where earlier 5 million barrels of oil that we consume, about four or five sources supplied 800,000 barrels a day or roughly thereabouts. Then what happened is the imports from one particular source went up, came down. Today you have a situation where from two of our sources, Russia down 5.7 percent, may come down further if what you say is correct. Saudi Arabia, which is a major supplier, there's a reduction. And, but there's a reason for that reduction. The reason is that Saudi Arabia charges something called an Asian premium, which is for countries in Asia to look at the differential between prices to Europe. Now, so obviously, if the importer, whoever it is, it's private sector, Reliance or um, Indian Oil or whoever it is in the public sector, these are global companies. One of them is the world's seventh largest company. The others are right. very big international companies. They will buy the cheapest. So if today Sir. Iraq, I believe, is selling uh, because mm. there is geographical proximity of distance. So this is a dynamic situation which will go on altering based on the current global situation. But two messages I want to give you. One, we are doing well. We are navigating mm. it well, essentially because we are playing the market card. If somebody comes and tells me, no, you have no mm. choice but to buy more expensive from me, I tell him, we used to buy from 27 countries, mm. now we buy from 39 countries. If you sell more expensive, I may have a cheaper mm. supplier. Did you ever imagine that we would be buying $20 mm. billion dollars of energy mm. from the United States in a year? I was Joint Secretary on the America's desk. I could never yeah. have dreamt of it. Uh, Mr. Puri, I, I just want to focus on that, sir. As you said, that you will go wherever you get the cheapest crude. Uh, can you explain to us where things currently stand in terms of the average price of crude in terms of Russian imports today? And who would be the cheapest supplier to India as of today of these 39 countries that you, or suppliers that you spoke of? You know, these are transaction-based values, madam. I don't think anybody is going to look at an average price. There was a time when there were very high... Uh, uh, Russian uh, discounts. There was another time very high discounts from some of the Middle East suppliers. And then it's not a question of what discount they're giving. You have to factor in the freight and the insurance. I mean, if you have a point proximate hmm. to India in the Gulf, obviously their freight cost is much less. On the other hand, depends on which Russian port you're going to get it from. If you get it from some of the northern ports, then the, the cost of freight is even more. It's a very complex system. But as far as we are concerned, it's not the government that does the buying. It is the companies that do the buying based on transparent tenders. And I can tell you the amount of requests, queries that we receive. How can we be a part? Today, India is one of the large markets for crude. And it's a place for energy where things are happening. Our ENP is going up. Our transition to green energy is gaining momentum. So there are a lot of people who would want to come in here and partner. Uh, most of the world's largest um, exploration and production companies have now got ties up here. The green hydrogen story is moving well. So this is a situation which can move dramatically. If somebody is undertaking voluntary production cuts, which is what is happening in OPEC+, Plus, well, they are trying to keep the price high. We, on the other hand, through uh, sensible buying, we will try and buy at the lowest price. There will come a time if the price is too high, People will not buy. There's a large economy in the world. 
uh, which has a 16 trillion dollar economy. You know for the fact that there are economic problems there. Their mm. capacity to buy even at the current levels may not be sustainable for a period of time. Uh, Mr. Puri, uh, you know, you talked about the transition towards greener projects and I want to ask you about that in the context of the fundraising that we've seen companies announce, whether it's BPCL or IOCL. Uh, each board has approved fundraising plans. If you can leave us with some milestones that you hope that these companies will be able to clock and achieve in the next 12 to 18 months. Sir. I know that there is a five-year window and a five-year roadmap as, as well, but I, I wanted to understand more in the immediate term what we can expect in terms of CapEx. Well, first of all, uh, there are separate issues involved, Shirinji, in your question. One is overall capital expenditure. All of them are meeting their capital expenditure targets very satisfactorily. The other is if you're talking about green hydrogen and the move towards green hydrogen. I'm happy about the fact that these companies are dealing with it. IOCL has 11 refineries. I think two are going to be uh, uh, producing green hydrogen. I'd like to see Mr. Vaidya uh, add another three or four to them, equally with BPCL and the other. Look, the fact of the matter is there's a lot of international money coming into the green hydrogen story in India. Sir, may I uh, ask you a quick question as far as the G20 preparation is concerned because you're also uh, uh, looking after urban development. Uh, and, of course, uh, the countdown, we are in the last lap now towards the G20 ministerial uh, on the 9th and 10th of September. What should we expect in the interim? Many restrictions uh, have been announced by the Delhi police, by the Delhi government, uh, etc. A layout for our viewers, sir what we can expect now as uh, as we get closer to the big event the ministerial well you know the country is going to be hosting i don't know what 35 uh, people at the level of heads of state or government or more i don't know i mean i mean amita will answer that question of jay shankar ji in more detail but you know that involves uh, issues of security access so obviously if you're going to tone down a little bit on your you know other uh, other carnival kind of activities which we keep having there's a beautification of the city which everybody is welcoming i find my friend arvind ji is also mm. trying to take a little credit out of that there will be other this thing so for those days of the summit obviously you don't want um, mm. you know logistical and other problems uh, but as i said i'm the wrong minister to ask as to what are will be the restriction all i can tell you is the eyes of the world will be glued on the screen, when we did Chandrayaan, I think it got 8 million views. Now you are on the moon and over the moon and this G20 is a great opportunity to showcase the progress that the country has made under the Prime Minister's leadership from 2014 to 2023. And in the process, we also add support to global efforts for, and for some of the work that we are doing, for that to be replicated in the other developing countries in the global south, and as the Gates Foundation, World Bank people mm. tell me, to replicate that on a larger scale, these are the opportunities that you get. And the G20, I mean, as I said, they, the, yeah. my, uh, the Prime Minister and my other colleagues have succeeded in producing a template and it's set the bar so high. I think that's what all other G20 summits after this are likely to be compared to. Always a pleasure, Mr. Puri. Thank you very much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Appreciate your time and your insights. Uh, that's it then on this edition of On the Record. Uh, we will take a quick break and return with more. Stay with us.